the other side of the moon will here in studio seven attempting to in studio seven attempting to describe the most historic event in my lifetime and perhaps yours neil armstrong had just landed on the moon but had not yet made his one small step in spite of what had seemed a flawless landing the tension here was difficult to describe and if you saw our program earlier tonight on bbc one you'll know that over in houston the flight controllers were just recovering from one of the most hair-raising experiences they'd ever had none of us in the news media knew how close that landing had come to disaster because we had not been told it would not have been good for nasa for the facts to be made immediately public in the 10 years since the world thrilled to these acts of apparently flawless daring much has come to light about how flawless the enterprise was none of it detracts from the tremendous courage of the men who flew these missions but it puts their efforts in a slightly different perspective it is now clear for instance that the machines were at all times not perfectly built and on one occasion fatally so that the idea of going to the moon in the first place was not kennedy's and that at all times the apollo missions were in political jeopardy depending on the incumbent president's priorities that throughout nasa had to fight to survive at all and that this the systematic scientific exploration of the moon by geologically trained astronauts happened late in the program almost as an afterthought and almost not at all I have always felt that Apollo was a great adventure story but not until now have I been able to appreciate in detail the other side of it here is that story When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, he came in peace for all mankind, or so it said on the plaque. In NASA, however, you think American. What did Apollo 11 mean to you personally? Apollo 11, to me, was an opportunity to... <laughs> okay, let me... That's because I always think team. It's, it's when you say personally, I, 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 I find it real difficult to... Uh... Okay, I got it. All right. What did Apollo 11 mean to you personally? Apollo oh, 11 to me was red, white, and blue, the American flag. It was that straightforward. I, I'd been in the military for a long period of time, I believe, in my country. And I was glad to be in a posture personally to give the United States the political, social, economic impact of, of the actual lunar landing. The decision to go to the moon was effectively made here in this car park behind the executive building in Washington on May the 6th, 1961, by two men, James Webb, the boss of NASA, and his associate administrator, Bob Siemens. You see, 24 days before, American self-esteem had been shaken to the core by Yuri Gagarin's first flight, and then a few days later eroded even more by the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The day that ended, Lyndon Johnson, the vice president, said to Kennedy, what we need is for you to write me a memo asking me how we can beat the Soviets in space. One day later, this memo turned up. It said, is there any way we can beat them in space? How much will it cost? Are we working 24 hours a day on it? And should we build bigger boosters to do bigger things? Well, by the end of April, LBJ had talked to enough people to realize that the only way to achieve a major propaganda victory was to go for the moon. And so, in the first four or five days of May, he had intensive meetings with businessmen, people from industry, the media, to find out if it could be done and what the public reaction would be. At the last of those meetings, he asked Webb if Webb thought that NASA could manage it by the end of the decade. And Webb said that he would need one more day to go back and consult with his experts. But as he and Siemens were walking back to their car in this car park, Webb turned to Siemens and said, I think we can do it. What do you think? Siemens nodded, and that was it. Nineteen days later, Kennedy went public on the 25th of May, 1961, in a State of the Union address to Congress.
Finally, if we are to win the battle that is now going on around the world between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. You'll notice the reasons Kennedy gave, the fight against communism, the need to impress the wavering outside world that the American way was the right way. There was also the fact that with the Korean War gone, the heavily defense-oriented economy was stagnant, and Apollo would provide jobs and money for industry. Kennedy made no mention whatsoever of science. Apart from a few interested researchers, the scientific community at large was against manned spaceflight. And anyway, there were no votes in science. And yet the US space effort had begun with science when back in 55, Eisenhower had promised to get the Navy to try and launch a small scientific satellite sometime in the future. It also began logically enough with weaponry and trying to build intercontinental ballistic missiles, this time by the army. In fact, Werner von Braun's army rocket, the Jupiter, could have put America first into space by a year when it launched in September 1956. It never reached orbit because Eisenhower was so anti-space race, he made them fill the rocket's final stage not with fuel, but with sand. In 1957, Sputnik proved him wrong. There was a race, and the Russians were winning it. America panicked. We should find out what they're doing that we're not doing, and we should do something about it very quickly. A secret report told Eisenhower that the Russians now obviously had rockets big enough for nuclear attack, but he considered the facts too gloomy for the public. While privately increasing missile expenditure, publicly he played Sputnik down. They have put one small ball in the air. After they'd done that trick a second time, Eisenhower gave Vanguard top priority. And in December 1957, the Navy were ready to retrieve America's reputation. Unfortunately, their rocket wasn't. General Medaris, von Braun's boss on the army project, thumped the table. America, he said, must go all out to beat Russia, a country that had only one aim in mind. ...that has as its ultimate goal the man domination of space. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. Ike partly conceded. In January 1958, von Braun's rocket put their first satellite up. In March, Vanguard finally flew. Now space was becoming a powerful policy instrument, Eisenhower decided to take it out of military hands. In July, he signed the Space Act, setting up the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, a civilian agency to run the manned space program. Insult was added to injury when the Army team was moved, lock, stock and rocket, to the new agency, including, of course, their genial leader, von Braun. I'm confident that eventually space exploration will so stimulate the imagination of the American people that they will be willing to give this challenging task the necessary financial support. I feel confident that we will see space flight in our time. What sort of a Within a year and a half, George Lowe was heading a secret NASA committee planning a moon trip before anybody had even left the ground. And still, no science. I don't think that we in NASA, in our initial planning, had anything but a vague idea that we'll also do some science, but certainly there was not any major scientific effort early on in the planning for Apollo. In 1961, Jack Kennedy became president, and for space, nothing changed. Worsening relations with Khrushchev over Russian intervention in Laos left Kennedy far more concerned about the threat of communism worldwide than about shooting men into space. Moreover, he was deeply worried about the commitment he'd inherited to support a strike against the new Castro regime in Cuba. Throughout the first few months of his presidency, the temperature of the Cold War went to freezing, and it was left to Vice President Johnson to keep NASA's morale from sagging through lack of presidential interest, 
which, in the light of events to come, was just as well. NASA was on the verge of its first manned flight when, on April the 2nd, Russia did it again. To America's chagrin, 23 days before their delayed Mercury launch was due, Yuri Gagarin went into space first. <laughs> A week later, the CIA-backed invasion of Cuba failed disastrously at the Bay of Pigs. An American hero was desperately needed, and when Alan Shepard briefly took on the role in a suborbital flight, Lyndon Johnson knew he'd backed the right horse when he saw how the flight had affected the American man in the street. Shepard's success clinched Apollo's future. There were now clearly votes in space. I was riding down the, uh, the street to, toward the Capitol with the vice president in an open car, and he looked at the, the thousands and thousands of people that lined the streets in, uh, in uh, reviewing this parade. And, and he mentioned a couple of times, he said, that it really is a tremendous public response to this particular flight. And he also said, Shepard, now that you're going to be famous, you have to remember a couple of things. He said, he said, never pass up the opportunity for a free lunch or to go to the men's room, <laughs> which I've never done since. <laughs> pass up the opportunity. James Webb, close friend of Johnson's, extremely successful businessman and new NASA boss, wasn't entirely happy at the unqualified commitment Kennedy then came up with on May the 25th to land a man on the moon within a decade. Well, I had no reservations about the engineering capability to do it on some time scale, but uh, I did fear that uh, the, the sort of uh, uproar that was created by Gagarin's flight uh, would not translate into long, sustained support for a very complicated and difficult project. As a matter of fact, I wrote a letter to the vice president at that time saying that I was perfectly prepared to go forward with this but that uh, he should recognize that if, if we didn't have the continuing support of himself and the president, uh, we'd be lost. We'd be like two foxes running in front of two packs of hounds, Congress and the press, and we'd be pulled down. Was, one, was there one man who fixed Congress? Because when Kennedy gave his speech, it was passed almost on the nod. This was Lyndon Johnson. Really? Oh, yes. I, you have no idea how much him, how people didn't want to... Uh, disagree with uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, they, he knew everybody on the hill and he knew about everybody on the hill and he knew where all the bodies were buried. Kennedy had effectively set the nation in a race in which by their own definition alone they were already well behind and so a colossal amount had to be done very quickly finding the right sites for the various administrative centers like Houston which was marshland at the time and all the political infighting that would involve. And then finding the right kind of people with the right kind of expertise to do the job. A team that within five years would add up to more than 400,000. And above all, Apollo was going to cost how much? Nobody knew. Estimates varied from $7 billion to $100 billion. But the one thing they did know was where it was going to go. Because it was NASA's proud boast that of every budget dollar, 90 cents would go to private industry. And interestingly enough, Kennedy had specifically said, when you go out looking for contractors to build your machines, don't just go to the people who are right technically. Be aware of the wider ramifications of who you give the money to. So we looked at a contractor's proposal. We looked how he would do the job. We looked at how he would have done something in the past. We looked at his management structure. And of course, we looked at costs also. But by no means did we always go for the low bidder, as has been, as we had been accused of at some times. As it happens, they did, with the Plum contract for the mother spacecraft worth $400 million going to North American aviation. The fact that they'd built and flown the X-15 rocket plane had put the astronauts on their side but North American had not come out top in the preliminary evaluations, and Apollo was bound to stretch engineering abilities to the absolute limit. Even the head of their space division at the time, Harrison Storms, who pushed for the contract in spite of internal opposition, felt that they were out on a limb. But uh, once you get people inspired to do something, they'll sometimes play ball games way over their head. 
and uh, I think we played as at least up to the capability and probably above the capability of the, of the division at that time. The technical demands on the lunar module contractors, Grumman, were to provide as many headaches, though not, as you'll see, to quite such a horrifying extent. But NASA expected some problems. When a contractor runs into difficulty, uh, he naturally thinks that he can solve it. We had to follow closely enough the developing difficulties that we knew what they were, knew what caused them, could send in task forces into the contractor's plant to work with the contractor to solve them. If they were not able to do it, they had to bring the equipment out of the contractor's plant to our own laboratories for testing and evaluation. So we, in a sense, uh, developed this pattern that wasn't to say, you've got a contract and you deliver or else you're going to be penalized financially. Uh, we said, the first thing to do when you run into difficulties is to find out what caused it, fix it, and then begin to assess the financial and other implications of it. This it was a reversal of, of, of the process followed in many areas of government. Seven. By the early 60s, to American eyes, it was hard not to see a space race, with the political and financial stakes escalating. In 62, before the one-man Mercury flights were over, the Russians had taken the advantage and the limelight again. In August of that year, they flew two spacecraft up to the first rendezvous in orbit. Space was in the headlines, and the fact that it shared the front page with a milestone of the Cold War, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, only served to underline the potential value of each space success, in propaganda terms, on the uncommitted nations. Space had become fully politicized. When Kennedy was killed in Dallas, the dream did not die with him, mainly because the dream and the ambition had been largely LBJ's all along. So now, space had a presidential champion. But American plans to take over the lead with the Gemini two-man spacecraft were once again preempted by the Russians, going one man better than five months earlier in October 64. But through 65 and 66, Gemini flew virtually unopposed, trying out in Earth orbit the necessary steps to go to the moon. A journey which, even as they rehearsed it brilliantly, was being jeopardized by events beneath them in Vietnam. The last Gemini splashed down in November 66, the Pacific Ocean, and triumph. It was only three months until the first Apollo flight. The new rocket had been successfully test flown, and at Cape Kennedy, the first Apollo crew were ready. Apollo 1 was to be flown by three of the press men's favorite astronauts, and was to be a trial run of all the systems in Earth orbit. Roger Chaffee was new to space. Ed White, first American spacewalker, and Gus Grissom, commander and veteran of the Mercury days. In spite of a demanding schedule, they found time to be photographed in the command module simulator, showing off their new, highly complex control panel. The real spacecraft was already on the launch pad, and on January the 27th, they were on board for a test countdown when something more important to NASA than the moon landing happened. Friday afternoon, late, around 6.30 at night, in January. It was dark out at the Cape, and... Uh, we had had a difficult time with our tests, difficult in terms of getting things to work, but not on the spacecraft. We'd had, believe it or not, most of our problems were communications on the ground. And at the time, it was a technical uh, problem of a three-wire, two-wire system for communication purposes, compatibility with the spacecraft. I know the comment was made, gee, if we can't talk to each other here on the ground, how are we going to talk to each other from the moon? But the, the test had been delayed, but we were very close to our... Uh, scheduled was a plugs out test. We we're going to disconnect the umbilical cord, uh, sort of isolate the spacecraft electrically, and not disconnect it uh, physically from the uh, rocket in any way. And uh, at the moment, we were just about ready to pick up. We had been in a hole for, and I just don't remember the reason now. I heard this uh, voice. I really don't recall the word, but I had a monitor right in front of me, and I was able to see a flash of light. And there was uh, three television views I was looking at. One looking right into the hatch of the command module. The one next to it was on the second floor, right below the command module. And I heard this uh, voice, there's a problem. I could see a light, and then on the second floor I could see some things swinging. There were wires. And what happened, this took place over about 19 seconds from the first flash till the time 
the spacecraft, uh, in effect, uh, burst and let, let pressure out. And what I was seeing on the second monitor, right next to the first, was some swinging of wires and things. We, we were, of course, uh, were totally uh, unaware of what was going on. We knew it was a serious problem. We had people right around the spacecraft. They were very nearby, because they were part of the test crew to disconnect plugs and do certain things. Once the smoke start uh, coming out of the spacecraft, the crew, our ground crew now, trying to get to the door, because at this test, believe it or not, we were going to be running an evacuation test of the spacecraft. The final part of that test that night was to check these procedures. The ground crew had to uh, work to get the boost protective cover off, and the outer hatch, and then the, the inner hatch. Went over a place for a couple of minutes, and um, when the hatch was open, you could see uh, just a void, and it was dark. And the pad leader reported to me that uh, he could see no one in there. And what had happened, of course, is the fire, which I said had really reached a pressure point in 19 seconds and burst the bottom part of the spacecraft, had blackened everything in there, and. Um, we tried to get the medics up there and things, but there really wasn't anything we could do. It was over so fast. The voice tape of those 19 seconds has never been released, and after the bodies had been removed, one reporter and one cameraman were permitted to record the scene. The spacecraft was taken away for the post-mortem to begin, and George Lowe, the spacecraft program manager, set up an investigation team headed by astronaut Frank Borman to find answers. They found them, and they were appalling. Because of fears that an air atmosphere inside the spacecraft would give the crew the bends on the way up, and to save weight, Apollo was designed to fly containing pure oxygen at five pounds per square inch pressure. But on the launch pad, that pressure had been increased to simulate the structural stress of the inside-outside pressure difference in space, closer to 20 pounds, and any undergraduate engineer knows that at that pressure of pure oxygen, the slightest spark will cause anything, even metal, to burn so fast it's almost explosive. Somewhere that spark had occurred. And worse, inflammable materials not in the original design had been allowed in. Velcro to hook things on, foam rubber cushions for temporary comfort. Most unbelievable of all, NASA itself had commissioned a report three years before that had stated categorically how dangerous this situation would be. And so had the contractors themselves. Neither group had read those reports, it seemed. The supreme irony was that in such an atmosphere, even the crew's spacesuits were inflammable. We missed that point in the, in the understanding of what we were dealing with. Oxygen and a massive amount of flammable materials and a spark uh, possibility. We missed that point. And that was the point that at, the, at that time had been brought over from the Gemini program and had brought over from the other historical events of the program in a way that uh, we carefully run individual strips in a laboratory, but we never put it all together as a system. And we put all other systems together as a system and ran them. And that was, to me, a major blind spot in the Apollo program, and one which, uh, as a program manager, I really can't see why we missed it. But we did. To the outsider, though, I mean, to the outsider, it looks... So incredibly simple. obvious yeah. that you should have done that. So simple and so obvious. And uh, there isn't any answer to that. One of the things that I've noticed on other projects as well as this one, as you get close to the ultimate payoff of the project and the ultimate usage, you begin to go faster and faster and faster. And sometimes it'd be just as well if you go fishing for a day or two and stop and think. There were many, many... Uh people who went to the president and uh, urged him uh, to uh, stop this. 
Some of them said that I was a killer, that uh, they should not let me fly these equipments. And uh, yet, uh, with the president, as we uh, developed the relationship, he always, whether it was Kennedy or Johnson, took a very simple position. Fly when you're ready and don't go until you're ready. Don't let the political pressures force you to go too soon and don't hold back uh, if the time is right. If the time was right for Apollo 1, the strange thing is why they had already redesigned the spacecraft. The new Block 2 spacecraft, as it was called, had a hatch that opened outwards. The dead crew hadn't been able to get out because theirs opened inwards. Well, it wasn't good enough yet. That's what we learned with the Apollo 1 fire, was that we weren't quite good enough. And, and look at what happened after that fire. The first time we put man in the, in the Block 2 spacecraft, the one that was redesigned under a new management system, that worked essentially perfectly, minor problems. And the second time we put men in it, we sent Jim and Frank and Bill around the moon. So that's the kind of confidence that, that doing things right uh, will build. I disagree with you, Jack. Uh, the Block 2 spacecraft was already design. There were some modifications to it. Those modifications were already in work before the fire ever took place on uh, the, the first spacecraft before those guys ever got killed. And we had 40 or 50 major failures on every Apollo flight, including the last one. But I'm talking about the confidence level, Jim, and I agree with you. The Block 2 was coming along. Jim, before the fire. The hatch was in the process of being redesigned because we felt that there was no way that you could do an EVA through that hatch. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But the thing is, we would never have gotten the hatch at the time had there not been the fire to... We would have gotten the hatch at the time because it was supposed to be on a, on a spacecraft that yeah. Dave and Rusty now were going to fly, which was the next one. Management, no. management no. astronaut. No. Uh, this reminds me of the me Monday morning Please. meeting. See, we no, still have some I, I would, I would we were on. No. Let, let me make one more point because uh, it's one I've thought about a great deal since then. Um... I'm not sure that we would have gotten to the moon if that hadn't happened. Because when we then, following the fire, made changes, looked at the spacecraft, examined it, tested it, we found other things too. One of the other things that was found, even as the spacecraft wiring was being redone and made safe, was that relations between North American and NASA were far from good. Over a year before, the Apollo program director, General Phillips, had written a secret report that had raised alarm about the quality of the contractor's work. At first, James Webb denied its existence and then admitted it. The fire forced NASA's hand. Webb reacted firmly, though perhaps late. We took the strong view in NASA that the changes that were required had to be made. And uh, we uh, advised them of that. Uh, they did not make them. And uh, so we called in five other contractors and started to negotiate to replace them as the contractor. At that moment, they made all the changes that were really necessary. However, the Those changes that, weren't only in design. Heads rolled, too. Discussed the thing. I discussed uh, my position with Mr. Atwood, who was then president of the corporation. He had heard from uh, Mr. Webb. And as Mr. Atwood so aptly put it, Stormy, they either want you out of that program or me. And I'm sure it's not going to be me. As things got better in the space program, elsewhere they got decidedly worse. The summer after the fire saw other fires of the race riots in Detroit and Newark. January 68, and in Vietnam, the Tet Offensive began, shaking American confidence that the war there was likely to provide them with a military victory. Back in the United States, racial violence flared up again, coupled with increasing unrest on the university campuses over America's Vietnam involvement. Then on April the 4th, in Memphis, while organizing civil rights demonstrations, Martin Luther King was assassinated. More riots followed. I thank you all of you. Robert Kennedy was the next to fall, two months later, in the kitchens of a hotel in Los Angeles on the 5th of June. Two months later, the Democratic Party convention came to Chicago, where Mayor Daley vowed to put down any violence firmly. The result was a state of virtual insurrection as the demonstrators were finally opposed by the National Guard. America was shocked by a military presence on her city streets. And it was time for the presidential elections and Richard Nixon. Tonight, 
I again proudly accept that nomination for President of the United States. Bad news for you. This time there's a difference. This time we're going to win. Meanwhile, NASA was having its own problems. Because of the death of the three astronauts, the contractors were under severe pressure to triple test everything and yet stick to rigid deadlines. And so in the middle of 1968, when the lunar module turned up here at Cape Kennedy for its first manned test flight, the people here took one look at it and reached for their small print. It was so full of faults, it was as ready to fly as a, a brick is. NASA was desperate. Confidence in the agency had never been lower. Something had to be found to jolt the public into delirious roars of applause, and it was not going to be the lunar module. But what? Time was running out from January 67 or April 67 when I took over the project to the end of the decade. We knew the moon was only going to rise and set, I think, 30 more times in that time period. It was, it was a very countable number of times the moon was going to be in the right position between then and the end of the decade. To me, that meant getting a major flight off before the end of 1968. Lowe's idea of a major flight was to leave the lunar module behind and take the command module alone out to the moon and back. With NASA under pressure in an election year and as yet no manned flight of the moon rocket, this total change of plan was extraordinary. Why then did it succeed? Uh, this took place while there was a very important international space conference in Vienna and the uh, administrator of NASA, my boss, went to this, the head of the manned space flight program went to this. And of course, as soon as the um, cats were away, the mice started to play, and Houston immediately came to Washington and said, Dr. Payne, uh, we have a very interesting proposition, which unfortunately, in the absence of the other people, uh, we will have to bring directly to you. We need a decision. Shall we start to prepare the software for a potential uh, lunar orbital mission with Apollo 8? And we'd had a little discussion of this, but really this was uh, quite a uh, far out and bold move. And I discussed this with uh, General Phillips, and General Phillips remarked that uh, he did have to tell me that uh, before his boss had left, uh, he'd been instructed not to do something like this. And I said, well, you're an Air Force general, you're not really familiar with the traditions of the Navy. Let me tell you about Nelson's blind eye. And I gave him a little <laughs> lecture on uh, when it's a good idea to uh, overlook a few instructions you may have received. And that was the spirit in which we proceeded. Uh, of course, there was some dismay in Vienna when they were called to the embassy and over a scrambler telephone told about this decision. Oh, my, my initial reaction was, you've, you've laid out a careful plan that will test every facet of this equipment before we do the lunar landing. And if we eliminate parts of those test flights and we have any trouble, then we are in serious trouble. So politically, if you look at it, I'm sure that Jim Webb must have thought we all had lost our minds. Uh, I felt that if you weren't willing to fly that flight, you shouldn't be willing to fly the landing. In fact, that's what I said. But I think his question must have been whether NASA could afford another failure and survive. Did you consider the possibility of failure? Yes, we certainly did, and I think that it's not uh, telling tales out of school to say that uh, that and other NASA missions involving hazard uh, we prepared uh, complete uh, contingency plans, including the announcement that the president would uh, have to make about uh, the brave astronauts who'd sacrifice their lives uh, for science. The moon mission would be only the second Apollo to fly, and it depended on the success of the first, Apollo 7, an Earth orbit checkout flight. If it worked, the way was clear. Just after 7 flew would come the presidential elections, Again, the political climate dominated NASA's behavior. To protect the agency, it was clear that James Webb would have to hand over to Tom Paine. Three weeks before an election, you're going to fly the redesigned Apollo that uh, in the earlier test stages killed three men. If you have any kind of trouble, it's going to have an effect on the election. And I wanted to be outside the government so I could speak my mind and take on the fight that this was the right decision and the program should go forward. And uh, so President Johnson and I reached a very simple decision. If I retired in October before the election and just before the, uh, the Apollo 7 flight, uh, the message would be very clear to whoever would be president, Humphrey or Nixon. You don't have to worry about this man Webb that has become controversial. 
The political and technical gamble had paid off. On Christmas Day 1968, Apollo 8 carrying Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders was in lunar orbit. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. For NASA and America, it was the end of a two-year nightmare. It was virtually certain that the moon landing would happen in time. Well, you know what happened next. They went to the moon and they brought back a total of over 800 pounds of moon rock, now officially classified as a national treasure, which is why this giant steel door exists. It has two time locks and only two people know each of the combinations of those locks. So all it takes is two people to be away with flu or for some other reason. And if you want to get at the rocks, that's your hard luck. Behind that door is what's called the pristine sample vault. So called because the rocks in there have never had any contact whatsoever with the Earth's atmosphere. The vault and the one next door form part of a $2 million complex that compares very favorably with Fort Knox because it's built to withstand hurricane, tornadoes, landslip, floods, and earthquakes. Each room has a different air pressure so that if the air leaks, it leaks out and never in from the dirty outside. And the place is packed with sophisticated burglar alarms like those microwave movement detectors. You may already have noticed one vital and interesting fact. There are no rocks here. That's because the place isn't finished. And it isn't finished for several reasons, one being money. It was originally due to come from the Treasury, but Congress sat on that idea. So the money had to come from NASA's already reduced budget. Giving money to space isn't fashionable anymore. And then back in 1968, when you would have thought they would have begun to build a place like this, they weren't really interested in sample return analysis, so much as whether or not the returning moon rocks would give us all a dose of lunar plague. And anyway, from the very beginning, the scientists had an uphill fight trying to convince NASA that there was room for science in the missions at all. Well, certainly, uh, at the beginning, it was not all sweetness and light. Uh, both uh, personality clashes, uh, differences in understanding, differences in perception of what the whole thing was about. Uh, around the time of Apollo 11, the, uh, the treatment of the lunar samples, which not only agitated my friend here extremely, but the rest of us pretty much too, the mistreatment of the lunar samples. There were many things at the beginning that we could find to be upset about and, uh, and shout about. What, what do you mean about, what, in what way were they mistreated? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what way, all uh, right. Uh, the lunar samples were recognized to be of some general interest, but it took a great deal of exorcise <laughs> to, to convince people that A, there were not trivial, but namely most substantial scientific interests in carrying out the scientific work on the rocks, that the rocks would tell you something very, very important, and not whether liver warts grew on them if they were watered, for example. <laughs> and that they were fundamental hist history of the sun and the solar system and the moon in those rocks and a we wanted them preserved we didn't want them dumped in sodium hypochlorite solution or pumped through a vacuum chamber and somebody wanted to do some good science with them and these three scientists were as responsible as anybody for the fact that apollo did anything scientific thanks to their pressure on the nasa planners early on not that much comfort came from apollo 11. immediately after touchdown the vital grab sample taken in case they had to leave in a hurry, was followed by a full-length, as-planned lunar surface period in which the rock samples were also grabbed in the last 20 minutes, thanks to various PR efforts. Uh, Neil and Buzz, uh, the President of the United States is in his office now and would like to say a few words to you, over. Would be an honor. Uh, go ahead, Mr. President, this is Houston out. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. And for people all over the world... When Apollo 11 landed on the moon, few people outside NASA realized just how close they had come to disaster in the last few minutes before touchdown.
For the people in NASA who did know, well, they had fulfilled Kennedy's promise. But they had also found out that doing so was a very dangerous business. And there were those who pointed out that Kennedy had, after all, promised only one landing and had said nothing at all about going on to do scientific things afterwards. There was a strong faction sure. in the agency mm -hmm. after Apollo 11 got back. That's all for Apollo. Let's do something else. You mm -hmm. have to remember the, the makeup just of, what I got. of the NASA people. Most of them are research people. And once they have done the research and all the development to get somebody to the moon, a lot of the people who really control the programs were looking at the next Well, project. I think there was also a concern uh, that we'd have somebody get on the moon and not be able to get off. And the, and the trauma of having somebody get killed on a, on a lunar mission would be more than the agency could recover from. I think that was yeah. short-sighted. We had that problem right from the beginning. But one of the things you have to remember is that the people who were in the management slots had been in it for a long time, starting from Mercury. And you yeah. get pretty old after a while. When the pressure's on you like that for a long, long time, it's, it sort of gets old. Did you feel um, that, that uh, with Apollo 11 you had fulfilled the promise that Kennedy had made and that uh, really that was all in terms of risking people's lives? You ought to do. How were your feelings? Well, we felt that we had fulfilled the landing uh, promise that, 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 that Mr. Kennedy had made. But uh, we felt that, that there was uh, a system designed and and a number of uh, units that could be used to learn a great deal more about the moon. And we were we recognized that we should go on and make more flights. But, I mean, you yourself toyed with the idea of stopping. Well, I, I didn't want to go on forever. Now, what had to be understood was at the time of Apollo 11, the first and prime aim had to be to get there, get there safely, and get home. Do some science but not to overload the ship, not to overload the crew. We had never been to the moon, man had never walked on the moon. So the amount of science that could be done probably had to be curtailed, but we knew we were going back. Yeah, but I don't think we were irresponsible in the sense that uh, we realized as scientists that the first objective was to get people to the moon and get them back safely. It was our desire that having done that, that you maximize the return. And on Apollo 11, that clearly was not done even with the primitive system you had then. Just as a trivial example, we're on the same committee supposedly responsible, responsible, not supposedly responsible, responsible for the distribution of the samples, and yet we were forbidden to talk to the astronauts who were in the same building. Uh, that was obviously a ludicrous situation and a, uh, you know, a perversion of this uh, desire to get people there and back without endangering their lives because of science. Serious science on the moon only began towards the end of the missions, in particular the last three. In all, Apollo brought back 383 kilograms of rock from six sites. Not ideal spots, but a compromise between science and safety. Can I need a bag? Yes, sir. Okay, 282. And because of NASA's early opposition to the idea, it was not until the last mission that the first geologist went. Wait a minute. What? Where are the reflections? I've been fooled once. There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange. Hey, it is. It's orange. Wait a minute. I put my visor up. It's still orange. Sure it is. Crazy. I've got to dig a trench, Houston. Look at it. This was one of the great disappointments. On the last mission, the crew came across orange soil. Was it that color because there was water or recent volcanic activity in the form of small vents or fumaroles? The geologist on the moon at the time thought so. Man, if there ever was a, I'm not going to say it. But if there ever was something that looked like a fumarole operation, this is it. As they found later, they were wrong. But the excitement it caused helped keep morale high during the diminishing number of minutes left before exploration of the moon would cease for the foreseeable future. And that, time, was another drawback. No matter how scientifically vital it might have been to stay longer and look harder, the astronauts' oxygen supply was all that counted. There isn't enough time, Tony. 
to do it, no matter which way you want to do it. We need more time. We may have to split. We have to split five minutes. You just told us to say they got to leave on time. That's all we can say. If they want to get more for us, that's gravy. <laughs> all we can tell is we're squeezing. But let's hope they don't have to walk back. As for the orange soil, it turned out to get its color from microscopic glassy spheres, evidence of intense heat, but not of recent volcanic activity, and certainly not of water, which was absent from all the rocks brought to the receiving lab, except one boxful which caused momentary excitement when it was found to be damp. But the answer was human contamination. Facilities for handling extraterrestrial materials have to be immaculate, and the original labs in Houston were not quite that good. But the scientists were delighted enough, once they got their first close look at the samples, to forgive NASA's penny-pinching and get down to some close analysis. No unknown chemistry was found, but a few new minerals were identified. You don't have to be a mineralogist to appreciate the effect of polarized light on a very thin slice of rock. Conversely, it seems, you don't have to be a layman to get a layman's thrill from getting hold of your first moon rock. Well, it's a piece of the Holy Grail, and it still is for many of us, and most of us still treat it as rather sacrosanct objects. Uh, it was a big trip. It was a big trip. Less than half the Apollo rocks were cut up and sent to the 118 labs that had successfully applied for a chunk of Holy Grail. The rest are to be stored indefinitely. Ask a fragment of rock the right questions, and it can tell you, as long as the position it was in when it was found is precisely documented, how old it is, how hot it's been, the history of the sun during its lifetime, what magnetic fields it's been in, and so on. Jim, this is Houston. Of all the experimental instruments placed on the lunar surface, perhaps that measuring the flow of heat out from the interior provided the most important information about the structure of the moon when its findings were put together with those of the seismographic measurements taken by the network of moonquake detectors placed at the six landing sites. So far, that information, together with the rest, adds up to this. It looks as if the moon has a solid outer crust down to about 60 kilometers depth. Inside that, there's some kind of mantle, perhaps like the Earth's. Below about a thousand kilometers, however, seismic evidence cuts off and leaves a question mark. Heat flow data say it can't be a molten core, but it might be a molten shell around a solid core. So, going to the moon hasn't answered the lunar structure question, it's complicated it. The thing that's missing, which most of us really feel is a big gap, are the things that are referred to by Jim, namely the highlands, which cover most of the moon, about which we know the least, and where we have very, very limited samples, except for a few chunks that got knocked in by major impacts. And there's, of course, where we hunger for information, and that's where the early history of the moon is. Wasserberg's lab has worked out the sequence of lunar history by dating when fragments of rock were last melted by the heat of meteor impact. Certain trace elements will give that date, so the fragments are dissolved in acid, and the tiny droplet is vaporized on a hot wire. The wire is heated in a mass spectrometer, and the trace element atoms are counted. Wasserberg's results have been startling. Before Apollo, the moon was thought to be somewhere around four billion years old, formed perhaps by the accretion process, a coming together of giant chunks of rock, and that other chunks continued to bombard the lunar surface in a steadily decreasing rate until now. After years of work with the Apollo samples, Wasserberg is certain that the moon is 4.45 billion years old, like the Earth, but that bombardment fell off sharply. Then, a second major phase of bombardment happened quite separately, and then the rate dropped to its present level. What happened in that early gap is still unknown. The bombardment history that was discovered was exactly what no one would have expected. In fact, we're still arguing about it, in which one may conclude with a great deal of certainty that somehow someone has stored out some small planets in uh, some outer part of the solar system, possibly the asteroidal belt, for a long time, like a half a billion years, and then threw them in so they fell on the other planets. This left an enormous imprint on the moon so that it may be governing the pockmarks we see in the moon and by transference may be the only chronometer we have for the rest of the rocky bodies in the solar system. So now when you look at Mars, 
Mercury and uh, maybe Venus, the big atmosphere, you now have a time, const time scale which is transferable, which also means that the Earth was bombarded then. I don't think any of us would have attributed major late bombardment to a normal solar system process. And that was a pretty substantial discovery. So we then had to reassess what the mechanisms of planetary evolution were like. And I would say that in terms of understanding planets, that was our first other planet. What about origin? Uh, do you know the origin of the moon now? No. Do you? No. <laughs> Ten years ago, before Apollo, of course, there were lots of guesses because nobody knew anything. But the minute the facts came in, it quieted all that speculation. Now it is reappearing. Maybe that means that the samples, and mainly the samples, are about to yield us an answer. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But it's fun to watch right now. It's an example of how ongoing the research process is. It's still very vigorous in 1979. It's not so vigorous in some areas. In 1977, budget cuts forced NASA to turn off the last of the Apollo lunar surface experiment packages left there by the astronauts. There goes. With the switch off, the stream of day-to-day -day information coming back from the moon ceased, so as to save a few more valuable dollars for NASA's other ventures, a few modest unmanned visits to the planets. But for those involved in Apollo, the irony in these planetary expeditions is that they could have been done without any of the manned spaceflight experience. So if Apollo was worth all the colossal expense to bring together a team of unparalleled technical ability, to build a complex transportation system designed only to take men to the moon. Why junk it after only a half a dozen trips? It's like building an airplane, uh, like a 747, flying it once and saying, yep, it really works, and then putting it in the hangar. I don't think people ought to do things like that. We would have liked very much to have had the uh, American public and the press and the Congress and the administration say, now, that we have explored our nearest neighbor, the moon. We would like to give NASA an even more challenging objective for the next decade, moving out to our sister planet, Mars. That would have been a magnificent mission for NASA, and we would certainly have welcomed it. But it would have been essentially a continuation of what I might call the barnstorming era of NASA. The uh, national mood in America has gone a long way from the exuberance, from the competitive spirit, from the confidence that uh, characterized the NASA era. At the time of the Kennedy decision to go to the moon, doing something like that was politically very popular. Um, six, seven, eight years later, it was not. So uh, Mr. Nixon made the, des the decisions that he had to make at that time, given political realities although I very much wish he had done much more for space. It looks as if the end of Apollo is a compromise that NASA had to accept or risk the end of manned spaceflight altogether. Apollo died as it was born to satisfy the needs of a new president. And yet, Apollo was a unique endeavor, unique in the sense that for a brief moment, 10 years ago, it united the people of America and the rest of the world in a way that they had never been united before and have not been since. In that sense, Kennedy was right. Most of us were impressed. Did we get anything else out of it? I think so. Not as yet from looking closely at the moon. We don't even know where it came from. And the knowledge has not told us where to go to get the raw materials we so desperately need, as we thought it would. Computers and micro-miniaturization? Well, Apollo really only speeded up developments that were already happening. But Apollo gave us two things that we wouldn't have had otherwise. One of them you never see, and yet it surrounds you. It's just not headline material, that's all. And it comes from thousands of little factories like this one at Hawpark in Long Island. In the early 60s, this small engineering firm was making that. Know what it is? Well, it hardly matters, but it makes the point. It's a one-way fuel valve for the lunar module. Fuel can flow that way, but it can't flow that way. As a matter of fact, this was never used because it's part of a backup system, and the primary system worked flawlessly. Flawless engineering is the point of the story. You see, because there were men on that rocket, every part made for Apollo had to be guaranteed to work 
with a reliability of 99.99992%. Now, although that generated a colossal amount of paperwork, it brought a large number of small companies, about 2,500 of them around America, into contact with the extreme demands of high technology and the testing techniques which they use here and the management systems you need to make something that reliable. Today, these people are using exactly those techniques in telecommunications and others are doing similarly different things. Zero defect engineering, reliability demonstration tests, systems analysis, they're abstract concepts but they affect our lives much more profoundly than Teflon frying pans or pacemakers. Because of Apollo, every bit of high technology around you fails just that little bit less often. The other thing that came out of Apollo is much less easy to analyze. Because although it may be the most extraordinary thing that has ever happened to us since we came out of the caves, there's absolutely nothing material you can point at that it did for us. I mean simply the fact that human beings have actually seen that. As a matter of fact, you know, you could take your thumb and you could hide the earth behind your thumb. And then you realized that all that you love and all that you know, all your, your life and your knowledge is really behind your thumb. And that you're really just an insignificant little part of this great universe. It gives you really sort of a humble feeling and, and more of a perspective of your part in this universe.